privilege to introduce my friend and colleague, AJ Hughes, Michael Berenbaum, Professor of Jewish Studies and Director of the Siggy Ziering Institute at the American Jewish University. He is a writer, a scholar, and a creator of museums. His work has been recognized by the Emmys and Academy Awards. Today, Michael will be in conversation with Rebecca Frankel, author of the New York Times bestselling book, War Dogs, Tales of Canine Heroism, History, and Love. She is the former executive editor at Foreign Policy Magazine, and her work has appeared in Smithsonian Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, and National Geographic, among others. I am looking forward to today's conversation with Rebecca and Michael as they discuss Rebecca's new, no new book, new novel, Into the Forest, an inspiring story of love and survival. First of all, good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. Rebecca, let me begin, um, as I spoke to you before, let me begin um, by saying that I was floored um, when I opened the book because I didn't realize what its subject was. And I have known the subjects of this book for uh, almost 50 years uh, from my teaching days at Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. Uh, and I had always known uh, Rabbi Lozowski's story, mm -hmm. but never known, and I had known the story of their incredible romance, but I never knew the story um, of Miriam's uh, story and the story of Miriam's family. So mm -hmm. you're going to have to um, fill us in. Uh, but uh, it, it, it is a, an astounding, remarkable story. Um, and let me just say that there's probably no way in which we can talk without giving away the plot. And let me correct Deb, who made an unbelievably rare mistake. It is not a novel. It is a historical account of um, a family, a rescue, and a romance. Right. So Rebecca, tell us a, a little bit about the story that you wrote and what's so tremendously compelling about it. Of course, thank you. And thank you everyone. It's, it's really wonderful to be talking with all of you. Um, so this book is about a family from a small town in Poland. The town's name is Jadol, and the family is the Rabinowitz family. And Morris and Miriam were the parents. Uh, they were young people in their 30s, just starting out their own family and flourishing. And uh, they had two young daughters. Uh, Ruth, who's Rachel in the book, and Toby, who's Tanya. Um, and basically what happens to this family, like so many other families in Poland and other countries in Europe, is that when World War II started, their lives were turned upside down. And so the town of Shetel was first invaded by the Soviets, and then of course in 1941, invaded by the Nazis. And they were interned eventually in a ghetto, uh, the Rabinowitz family. With their two daughters they managed to stay together with a couple of their other relatives which is the beginning of how remarkable this story is um, the family being able to stay together and then of course while they were in the ghetto being that Jettel was a forest adjacent town the one place they had to give them hope of escape uh, of fate that they knew was otherwise coming to them which of course was death uh, let, me make, let, let, me, let me interrupt only to make a yeah. pain of neck historical comment. For sure. Geography played a major role in the survival of some people. Yes. And that is that, uh, listen very carefully to what Rebecca accurately said, which is proximity to the forest. And these were massive forests. Yes. Proximity to the forest gave the possibility of escaping into the forest and surviving in the forest. Yes. For those places that were geographically adjacent to a forest mm -hmm. and their particular luck was that their town was adjacent to the forest. Yes, that was uh, just one of the many sort of uh, faded fortunes of why this family was able to escape death at so many different turns, which is, of course, what they had to do, which is, of course, the sort of a running familiar theme of so many people who survived. And yes, that they were close to the forest, and this was a great advantage to them. And in this particular family, an even greater advantage was that Morris Rabinowitz had been a lumber dealer in his life before the war. 
And not only did he know his way around the woods, but he had relationships with the Christian farmers and the forester in uh, in this area. And that proved uh, to be greatly beneficial to them later when they are they did make it to the woods, which this family of four did. So this love story that you're referring to, and I would like to say that I think actually there are two love stories, very compelling, gripping love stories in this book. And of course, one of them is between Morris and Miriam Rabinowitz. And then the other started uh, really the, the sort of the origin of this um, goes back to another moment, a, a, a terrible and a wonderful moment um, in this family's history. Uh, it was during the very first ghetto selection in the town of Jadol that all of the Jews were corralled into this space right outside of town. And it became very clear to the people who were uh, the Jews who were pushed out of the ghetto that this was a selection. And what that meant, of course, was that people who had working certificates or could prove that they could be useful in some way to the Nazi regime that was there in the town, that their lives would be spared. And for anyone who wasn't or who didn't have a work certificate, that they would be taken away and killed. And it was a terrible scene of a lot of brutality. And the Rabinowitz family was there, Morris and Miriam with their two young daughters. And Morris was separated from them. And Miriam was there with just her two young girls, uh, Rachel and Tanya, Ruth and Toby, who were six and four years old. And at the same time, a young 11-year-old Philip Lazowski was also in the same ghetto selection. He had also been separated from his family, and he was there in these terrible circumstances on his own, and he had no way to show that he belonged to anyone. And so what happened in this very long line that had formed um, to determine their fate, you know, to the left was to live and to the right was to die. Uh, he instantly understood what was happening. And so he approached a number of people to try and get them to help him. And people were turning him away, people he knew, in fact. Um, and so what he did is he scanned the crowd and he saw this woman who had a very kind face. And he saw that he was, she was with her two young daughters and that she had a working certificate. And he went up to her and he said, you know, will you please pretend that I'm your son? And Miriam Rabinowitz, without hesitating, said, if the Nazis let me live with two children, they'll let me live with three. And so she pretended that he was her son. And so that was the moment where the two families crossed paths for the very first time, the Lazowski, Philip Lazowski and the Rabinowitz family. And it wasn't until many years later after the war that our, our really our second wonderful romance in this book begins, which is that, of course, between Philip Lazowski, who would become Rabbi Lazowski, um, and Miriam Rabinowitz's oldest daughter, Ruth. But you begin the book by telling of a moment at a wedding. Yes, yeah. a Brooklyn tell, wedding. Tell, tell the story. Tell the story right. of that wedding. It's a good story. So it's Philip was asking. Story. It's a great story. It's a great story. It's a, it's a, it gives you chills kind of a story, I've been told. Um, so after the war and after emigrating to the United States, Philip Lazowski was living in Brooklyn. And he gets invited to a wedding. He's reluctant to go. He's concerned about his accent. He's concerned about his clothes, but he goes because he wants to meet people his age. And he goes to the wedding and he's sitting at a table and there's this beautiful young woman sitting next to him and they start to talk. And it turns out they're both from small towns in Poland. And it turns out that she knows she's heard of his village, Belitsa, which is a very tiny village. Um, and she says, you know, I know a woman who saved a boy from Belitsa. And he says, really? And he asked her to tell him the story. And so she's telling him the story. And he says, that's me. I'm the boy that was saved in this story. And it turns out the woman was a very good friend of Miriam Rabinowitz's daughter, Ruth. And so she gives him, you know, tells him that they're living in Hartford, Connecticut. And he runs downstairs to find a payphone. And he only has enough coins in his pocket to make one phone call. And he calls the operator and she says, who are you trying to reach? And he says, Rabinowitz is in Hartford. And the operator tells him, but there are six Rabinowitz you know, houses, you know, which one do you want me to call? And he says, pick the first one. And the phone rings and who answers the phone, but Miriam Rabinowitz. And so he eventually goes, he makes a visit, he pays a, a visit to this woman who saved his life. And as he's leaving their house for the first time, he says to the older daughter, Ruth, you know, I'd like to, to write you a letter, is that okay? 
and she she says okay and i don't think romance starts sparked at that moment but eventually it did and they've been married now for more than 65 years and so well, that's if that, doesn't, if that doesn't encourage you to buy the book i don't know what will but let's go back now and talk about and, and this is what I appreciate it because um, I lived in Connecticut and one of the people that I came to know in Connecticut was Rabbi Lozowski, whom you're going to call rabbi and I've known him and, and I am also a rabbi, so I feel comfortable calling him Phil. I cannot but, do that, but yes. Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> I, 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 have, I have no problem. Even his son more than on more than one occasion calls him rabbi because he really... He really embodied all the wonderful characteristics of the best of our, our rabbis. But having um, said that, um, the romance develops, they have a 65 year um, uh, marriage, but the Rabinowitzes had an incredible journey. They did. Tell us a little bit about their journey. Well, so, you know, Really, their their journey is is incredible, and it starts, of course. I I feel very strongly with their relationship, which was one built very much on mutual respect. They were both independent individuals in their own right, and they had a very very strong love for each other, and that was very much infused in their family and the way they raised their children. And so, when all of the horrible events took over their lives and forced them out of their home and into the ghetto, and eventually you know, as they made their escape to the woods, I think that that there is this desire to be together. Um, and I think it helped them face uh, the terrors of the woods and, and, and the greater Holocaust, of course. But their story is remarkable in its details as well, which is how they made their escape from the ghetto. They managed to escape not together, but separately. Um, Morris uh, went to the ghetto selection in August of 1942 that they anticipated was coming. And in anticipation of this, they had uh, dug a dugout in the house where they had been staying. And so he hid the family in the dugout and he went to try and save his sister and his mother who didn't have any protection of a working certificate. The other men in the family had already been killed. And so there were two women with young children on their own and he went to go and try and intervene on their behalf. And in the meantime, Miriam and her sister Luba were with the two girls, Rachel and Tanya, Ruth and Toby. Um, and I won't give away too many details, but they all managed to escape um, into the forest and then started this whole other ordeal of surviving the woods, uh, which, as you mentioned, was a pretty difficult thing to do. Pretty difficult is an understatement. Rebecca, you write in incredible detail. Mm -hmm. How did you get to know this detail? Oh, well, thank you how for did, that question. <laughs> how, did you, how, did you, how did you learn this detail? And so, you know, not, only, not only does she write in, in great detail, but um, in a very compelling, moving and powerful manner, but you, you get a feeling that almost that you were there. That's hmm. not an easy accomplishment. Thank you. And I don't give compliments easy, easily either. Well, that's a compliment I really very much appreciate because this was not an easy book to write for many reasons. Um, and one of those reasons, of course, is that while Ruth uh, Lazowski and Toby Langerman, Rocha and Tanya Rabinowitz are still with us, and I have been able to interview them over the course of many years, um, they were very young children when they experienced the Holocaust, when they experienced the forest. And so their memories are actually quite incredible, um, but they're not particularly detailed. And of course, their understanding of children of what is going on is very much colored, I believe, by how well protected they were. So what I had to do was take their experiences and, and try and gain as much peripheral understanding. So, you know, Ruth has wonderful memories of Jettel and the family there. Morris had a business, Miriam had a business, her grandparents owned a tavern. She remembers these things, which is amazing, but that was her only real view of Jettel. And so what I did is I tried to find as much testimony as I could. Um, and in this way, I sort of encountered a whole community of people, survivors who had been in Jettel, whether as children or as adults, whether through written testimony or watching Shoah Foundation 
testimony and tapes over and over and over again. Um, and I just picked up as many details as I could. And it was like a giant puzzle was getting filled in very, very slowly to create a view, you know, which was always very much on the family, but I was able to, to pull out and pan back and see more people and see more families. And that's essentially how I did it one, one little bit at a time. Tell us a little bit about your personal collection, connection to the family. So <laughs> Philip Lazowski, who I can usually only call rabbi, uh, I grew up in West Hartford, Connecticut, and my family were members of Beth Hillel Synagogue, which is where I attended synagogue during all of my growing up years, I say. And so, uh, you know, rabbi presided over my bat mitzvah and my sister's bat mitzvah, and he officiated my grandparents' funerals. Um, they were in Ruth and Rabbi Lazowski were in our home a lot. Um, you know, they're both the most life loving people. And so they're, you know, my interactions with them, even some of the time I was like six years old, made a very big impression on me because they're lovely people. You just want to be around them. Well, the, the other thing about um, uh, Rabbi Lazowski was, um, you know, we have an image of rabbis who sit in their study and, and read. Um, I always remember him bouncing around everywhere. Yes, <laughs> that is that is accurate. Bounce, bouncing around everywhere. There, there was a, both to to uh, Phil Lazowski and, and to Ruth. There is a, an incredible vitality, mm -hmm. um, uh, just an incredible vitality. But I, I never saw him sit at a desk. I saw him bounce up, grab of this, say mm -hmm. hello to somebody in between conversation okay. for or conversation interrupt us because he had three or four more things to do yes. at the same time, but never ignoring you, rather engaging everyone. No, absolutely. I mean, they're they're very much beloved. You know, I I think that it, there's there was a hesitancy almost on my part a little bit because I know how much people in their community and their community is huge. Of course, it's not just in Bloomfield or West Hartford, Connecticut, it's throughout the state, it's all over the world, you know, people really do know them. And people also knew Rabbi's story. And this is something you said to me earlier when we were talking that you knew Rabbi's story, but not Ruth's story, you knew about how their romance began and this incredible connection they have because of course, Ruth's mother intervened on Philip's behalf when he was a boy. But Ruth's family story was not as well known. And so in approaching them when I did in, in very late uh, 2015, actually, to sort of say, I'm thinking about writing another book, I'd like to write your story. It really was mostly through my connection with Ruth at that time. And I, the story is just so big that it, they both can't fit into a book. They, you know, they need their own space. And of course they cross over when, when they do, but um, the Rabinowitz family story was sort of how I got to spend, to know them even even better. Um, and it explains in some ways to me, a person who's known Ruth almost my whole life, um, where this vitality and this love of life really comes from. I think it's very much a part of the, not only the family's origin story, right? Uh, this is how the Ruth and, and uh, Rabbi met and fell, eventually fell in love, but it's the legacy of Miriam's intervention. I know Alan Lazowski talks about this. The grandchildren talk about this. Um, it's it's really a part of how their worldview and how they engage in the in the world. Philip did not stay with them in the forest. Where did he go while they were surviving in the forest? In other words, this was a this was a momentary encounter, mm -hmm. but the single most decisive encounter in ever in, in everyone's life. Yes, it was. And, and, and let's let's also say one thing for uh, this is a pain in the neck historian. Um, understand this that that the difference between life and death could be one moment of decency. Mm -hmm. A woman who decides that listen to the words. I mean, Miriam's moment uh, of of not only her sole moment of greatness, but her moment of absolute greatness. And you capture it so beautifully. If I'm gonna survive with two children, I'm gonna survive with three. 
-hmm. And that that gives somebody a life, and 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 Phil Lazowski must now be in his late eighties, early nineties. It's given him, you know, he was eleven years old in nineteen forty uh, uh, one. He's probably nineteen forty two. He's 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 uh, ninety. Uh, uh, 90 years old at this point it's given him given him uh, 79 additional years of life brought the uh, family children and everything else and look at it one moment one intuitive gesture no great thinking about it just a feeling this is what i have to do yeah it's funny i think about miriam's i don't even know if it was a decision i think she just responded she just she just did and I've talked to Ruth about it and of course to Rabbi and Toby and their children and the grandchildren. And, you know, we all hope when you think about that moment, we all hope we would do the same, but you don't know, you just, you just don't know. And so it is an incredible kind of legacy to, to grow from it. Um, but of course, to answer the question about where Rabbi, where Philip Lazowski ended up, their experiences diverged um, during the liquidation of the Jettel ghetto. And um, Philip's family was also in hiding during that time, just like the Rabinowitzes were, but they were uncovered. Uh, they were discovered in their hiding place, they were dragged out, and they were brought to what amounted to a, a second liquidation. And this is another moment in Philip's life where a mother, his mother, acted quickly and saved him, and she did so um, in, the, in the nick of time, really, and she pushed him out of a window and he landed safely and he was able to run away from there. And where he ended up going was a labor camp nearby, the Dvoritz labor camp. And it was believed that there was some hope that the Jews who were there would survive because they were working. And so he had heard of his father who had managed to get away earlier um, before the liquidation um, began or, or just as liquidation began actually. And he was hoping to join him there. So. Philip on his own with another young boy managed to make his way there. And so he eventually was reunited with his father and only one other brother of the many children in his family. The rest were killed along with his mother. Um, and they survived in a different part of the forest. They were closer to the Jewish partisans um, working there. And what's amazing is I found out that in my research, they actually all went back to Jettel after the war was over. I, the war wasn't actually over at that time after they were liber liberated by the Soviets and the- Well, uh, it's, it's important again, the historical thing, the war ended in different places at different times. Right. Uh, and that is that, that um, as the Soviet offense in the East mm -hmm. kept moving westward, Right. The war ended for a whole range of areas in 1944, right. months and uh, months literally before the war formally ended. Absolutely. And these, people, these people were living free in their territories, mm -hmm. precisely as the murders were continuing further westward. Absolutely. So, and it became uh, so much more desperate and haphazard in a way the, the, as the Nazis were retreating. Um, and they experienced part of that in the forest, certainly. But so- no, they, You had no access to Miriam or to Morris. I didn't. They, they both died in the early 1980s when I was about three years old. Um, but what I did have access to, which proved to be one of the most remarkable pieces of family archive that was shared with me, um, was an audio recording that Ruth had made, Ruth Rabinowitz Lazowski made when, when Miriam was ill, she passed away of cancer. And so Ruth interviewed her and taped it. And I had those tapes. And if you had one question to ask of Miriam, uh, what would it be? Only one. <laughs> Only one. You no. This I, is I too think, hard. I'm I think, I too think hard. it's clear. I think it's clear, Rebecca. If if Miriam were to come back, you could have at least a month's conversation. I it would be endless. And I, you know, I think about them all the time. Still, even now that the book is over, and um, I know it's brought up this process. And now that other people are experiencing their story for Ruth and for Toby, that you know. She's think they're both thinking about things that they haven't thought of in years or, or never thought of, or maybe never thought to even ask 
their parents. I think I'd probably have to get in line, <laughs> but um, I, oh, so much. I, I think I would want to know about the forest. I would want to know how they kept, how they kept it together, how they kept their hope alive, really. Um, I know they had each other. I can imagine it. And I feel like I know them well enough to make assumptions even, which in, you know, in journalism, we don't necessarily do that. But um, I, I would want her to hear her talk about that. How long were they in the forest and what did they, let, let's talk about what daily life mm -hmm. in the forest was like. But let me make one more historical point, which I want everybody to understand. You know, people sometimes ask, why didn't people resist? And the most interesting thing is to see the way in which powerless people were not passive. Absolutely. They created, again, they created a dugout. Mm -hmm. Philip's family created a hiding place. Mm -hmm. They escaped to the forest. They tried a whole range of strategies uh, to survive and improvised all the way through. Yeah. What do you what do you eat in the forest? How do you stay warm in the winter? What do you what do you do? You've so, you've, you've been there and you've been there uh, uh, in in trying to recreate this. Tell us a little bit about the mundane nature of life. Right, and it it was very much that. Um, I think, in addition to being uh, sort of burdened with the the fear of being discovered because there were regular raids, um, not just by the Nazis, but of local hunting parties, Poles and Belarusians, Lithuanians. Um, and also just if, if the locals who were put in this terrible position of being threatened, their lives were threatened, their livelihoods were threatened. They informed if they just came across a group of Jews hiding, you know, there was a reward for, for giving them up. Um, but it was difficult. And there were some families like the Rabinowitz families who had connections to people who were, who cared about them, who were not Jewish, who, you know, lived on farms, who could sneak them food and who were uh, able to give them intelligence about where the Nazis were, where they were coming from, so they could shift their camps around. Um, but again, it was very helpful for this family because Morris had such a strong familiarity with the forest and he knew which mushrooms were safe to eat and which ones weren't. I mean, you have to think about it, even in forest adjacent towns, there are people who were tailors or, you know, uh, shoemakers and probably hadn't spent a lot of time in the woods. And I mean, God help any of us who would ever be put in that position, but I wouldn't know how to feed myself just foraging around a forest floor. Um, so there was there was that uh, there was a lot of um, begging going to, to farmers, you know, they would go two or three towns away. So it would be harder to be discovered and, you know, beg for potatoes um, and other things like that. Uh, and what they did is they built uh, these little dugout shelters called Zimlankas or Zimlanki. And they were basically giant holes in the earth that were supported with found beams of wood, or they would find a way to cut down trees or branches, and they would sort of fortify the walls. Um, and then they would be flush with the forest floor, but they would create very small roofs um, that were sort of camouflaged, so they wouldn't be noticeable to people who were walking by. And they had little outlets so they could have fires going in the winter and they created bunks in the walls. So they would have like makeshift beds. Um, and so there were these little communities that they would move around and in the summer they would create like teepees or tents and live, you know, stay above ground. But there was a lot of moving, there was a lot of running um, and there was a lot of fear of being discovered and having to be quiet and knowing not to, you know, burn fires during the day because they didn't want to create a beacon of their, you know, their location and, and things like that. Um, we've been asked two questions that, um, uh, number one, did Philip and Ruth uh, record a video for the um, Shaw Foundation? They both have. They both have given testimony, I think in 1996, if I remember. Um, and you can you can go and watch them. And so did uh, Toby Langerman, uh, Tanya Rabinowitz, Ruth's younger sister. Her testimony is there as well. And Phil, uh, Rabbi Lozowski wrote a book called Faith and Destiny. 
Yes, one of his books, but this is right, the one about one of, his, his, one of his books, which tells which tells his story. Mm -hmm. And that's another way again. And um, my friend Karen Cass has asked an amazing story. And uh, given the fact that you're in Holly, you're speaking from Hollywood, she says has been optioned for a film. Has and it? Answer, does, does she has know it something been I don't? <laughs> for a film. And the answer um, is probably not yet, but I, I hope that's the answer. Out. Not not yet. Um, I think, you know, I don't know. The response to this story, even when I've told it over the years, when people ask, you know, what are you doing now? And I say, I'm working on this book and I tell little bits of the story. The the response is so it's it's visceral, it's very emotional. I you know, and I I felt it was very important and I'm glad it made it in there. The word triumph is in the book subtitle because it's important to know these stories of survival and resistance. And I absolutely agree with what you said. Um, even, I think even just being hopeful that they would survive was an act of resistance given the situation that they were in and what they were experiencing and enduring. But um, this particular family triumphed and, and by more than just surviving, um, they made their lives happy. You know, they had joy, they, you know, they went out and experienced as much as they possibly could. Um, and I, I guess we should also tell our tell our um, audience that um, anytime you park at Laz Parking, <laughs> uh, no, 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 it's going to give them it's going to give them a connection. Whenever you park at Laz Parking, that is uh, started and owned by Alan Lazowski, mm -hmm. who is uh, one of uh, Rabbi and Ruth's uh, sons. Yeah. So whenever you see the word Laz, I want you to recall how dramatic a story gave rise to this experience. Uh, and, Nancy, yeah, good. Well, I was just going to say very quickly, since you brought it up, one of the things that Alan likes to talk about very much is that he started that business with a loan from his grandfather, Morris. And that's how he got started. Okay. How many years did they live in the forest? And um, like tell us the story of liberation. So they were in the forest for almost exactly two years. Um, the ghetto liquidation in this Jettel. 42, 42 to 44. 42 to 44. So the ghetto liquidation was, it took days, but it was from August 6th through 8th as the official record. So that's when they escaped into the woods in 1942. And then they were liberated by the, the Soviets in probably August, late August, 1944 maybe September, but I, I'm pretty confident that it was in August based on other testimony of people who were in the woods at the same time. Um, and liberation, uh, one of the other survivors who was in the forest with their family is a man named Ted Weinstone, or his name at the time was Tuvia Weinstein. And I was fortunate enough to go and spend a few days with him. He's, he lives in Memphis with his family. Um, he has the most astounding memory. Um, and he told me that the first two weeks of the woods were the worst and the last two weeks of the woods were the worst. And the reason for that is as the Soviets were coming in or getting closer and closer, there were parachutists coming down and telling them that they were getting the advantage on the German army and that was welcome news to everyone there. But what ended up happening is these very stray communities of people hiding in the forest were caught between them. And what happened when the Nazis were turning on their heels and running, of course, west and trying to retreat is they, you know, uh, instead of just running, some of them were trying to take uh, as many people as they could with them, or they were hiding also in the woods, uh, not wanting to retreat, but just to avoid being killed by the Soviet army. And it made it very, very dangerous for the people who were hiding there. And so what the Rabinowitz family had to do is very uh, fortunately and smartly, um, I think at Morris's behest, the men in the family camp had dug another underground bunker away from their camp. So they had some place to run to. And that's what they did. And they spent two weeks hiding underground in a very small space with very little ventilation. Um, and almost, almost no food. And almost no food. They could only come out for very brief intervals at night when it was safe. And you know, it was just, it was hot, it was dark, it was damp, they couldn't clean, they couldn't talk, there wasn't a lot of, you know, fresh air to breathe, and they could hear people walking above them. And so it wasn't until there was a, um, 
somebody who lived locally, a peasant who they trusted came to them and told them it's safe to come out now that they came up. Rebecca, what did writing the book do to you? Do to me? Um, you know, it, it was a very much a labor of love for many reasons. Um, this, of course, probably for all of us tuned into this conversation is a pretty um, personal it's it's a history that's important to all of us as it should be to the entire world but especially to those of us who have had family or connections to this part of the world um especially if they're survivors in our own families um you know it it both opened my eyes to the the depths of humans ability to be good to each other and of course the depths of how awful we can be to each other. And I was just actually talking to a very good friend of mine that I grew up with. And we went to Camp Shalom in Connecticut where Ruth and Toby went as girls after the war. Um, and she was just saying one of the most gratifying things to her about reading this story is that she, it was so wonderful to see how they survived. They didn't just survive, right, as I said before, but they survived in this such a positive way and they, they made it, they made it through. Thank you very much. Um, I personally am deeply grateful that you wrote this book. It forced me to reread, it encouraged me to reread Philip's story, and it brought back uh, warm memories about two wonderful people. And also tells us one other thing, which I think you captured so nicely. One of the, some survivors essentially learn from their encounter with death to embrace life to its absolute fullest with vibrancy, vitality, love, action, movement, mm -hmm. and um, a, a real sense of celebration. They were privileged, lucky to survive, and they have made an incredible uh, journey with their survival and they've embraced life to its highest intensity thank you very much rebecca